Many years ago, someone asked John D. Rockefeller, a man who was known to have quite a bit of money, as you might recall, how much money would it take to make you happy? Some of you perhaps have heard what Rockefeller replied, just a little bit more. And isn't that typical of our world today? People, no matter how much money they have, many of them say, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had a new car, if I just had some new clothes, I don't have to have a whole new wardrobe, just a couple of new spring outfits. Or if I just had enough money to pay all my bills. Or if I just had enough money to give my grandkids and great-grandkids the presents I'd like to give them. We have a great-granddaughter whose birthday we're celebrating this afternoon. And uh, those are the kinds of things that are true for so many of us. In reality, when it comes to material things, we often are like the rock group that said they can't get no satisfaction. We just need a little bit more. <coughs> the reality is we're not content. And Paul's got to talk about contentment. Contentment doesn't start with what you have or what you don't have. Sometimes we think it does. If I just had more stuff, if I just had more of this or more of that, and by the way, the lessons we're having here on Sunday afternoons really go right along with this. If you haven't been a part of the Financial Peace University, uh, that, that uh, is the lesson there. In reality, contentment comes down to what you think. And if you don't remember anything else I've said this morning in the message, I'd love for you to remember that contentment comes down to what you think. And that's true not only of finances, it's true in everything. And uh, some of you may recall uh, the French philosopher René Descartes, who expressed it this way in Latin, cogito ergo sum. And what he was saying is, I think, therefore I am. Now Descartes was arguing for the assurance of our existence. Am I really here? Am, am I? And there's a wiser man than Descartes, whose name was Solomon, who once put it this way, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In reality, our thought life is so critical. And today we're going to connect, uh, look at the connection the Apostle Paul makes between our thought life and our behavior and even our possessions and our attitude toward our possessions. You may recall that as we've studied through Philippians, we've seen a constant theme of joy. Paul has urged these Philippian believers in chapter 4 and verse 1 to stand firm in the Lord. And he's encouraged them to be at peace with each other, calling out some specific individuals. And then talked about everybody needing to rejoice in the Lord always. Even when your circumstances don't seem to call for rejoicing. He says in every situation. And again he says, I say rejoice. And he calls on them to let their moderation, their sweet reasonableness be known to all people. And then his pointed statement that I've looked at so many times and it's been of help to me and many of you have looked at it as well and I've shared it with many over my years of ministry. Be anxious for nothing. Literally stop being worried about anything. Now worry is the most common thing that we have in our world today. People are concerned about the future, what's going to happen, am I going to make it? Is my health going to hold? Will I have enough money at the end of the month? Or will I have more month at the end of my money? And the reality is God wants us to basically stop worrying. You say, well, what can I do to stop worrying? And Paul's answer is start praying. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Whatever burden you have come to church with this morning, God wants you to take that burden and place it on the Lord in prayer and lift your heart and your voice to Him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And we all have so much to be thankful for. And He says, let each of those specific requests be made known to God. Now, we might think He would say, and God's going to grant you everything you pray for. But He didn't say that. He didn't say if you're praying for a Mercedes or a Beamer or if you're praying for a brand new house or whatever, 
What he says is, he will give you the peace of God that passes all understanding. And he said that will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Just think about it. God's peace, beyond our understanding, beyond what we can figure out, is standing guard over our hearts, our emotions, over our minds, our thought lives. And so thinking is so important uh, to God uh, in our Christian life. And then Paul says, finally, brethren, he said finally once or twice before, like the preacher that uh, sometimes tries to wind up his message and then finds more things to preach on. Uh, you've heard that story before. Uh, the pastor's son sitting with the little bitty boy next to him and his dad says in closing and uh, the young uh, boy with the preacher's kid turns to the preacher's kid and said, what does that mean? And he says, not much. <laughs> yeah. And Paul, you know, had trouble winding up what he had. He didn't go for a long time with these Philippians. But he had a lot to say. Finally, brethren, these are believers, and he talks about what right thinking looks like. He's getting to his conclusion. He's going to mention eight specific items here that we ought to be thinking about. First of all, whatever is true, whatever things are true, this is the opposite of false, of faith. This is genuine. You know, it's interesting. We hear a lot today about fake news, don't we? That's a phrase that's become very common. And sometimes it's hard to separate fake news from genuine news. But Paul says for the believer not to be thinking about those things that are fake, those things that are false, but to be thinking about that which is genuine, which is true. In fact, Paul said in Philippians 4.15, to speak the truth in love. Our thought life will lead us to saying the right things, that which is true. And then he goes on, whatever things are noble. And the word that he uses here is a word that means worthy of respect, of dignified, of that which is honorable. It's interesting that this word, noble, was used of the leadership in the church, the elders and deacons, in Titus chapter 1 and in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a characteristic that God wants to see among his leaders. It's interesting, I recall when I went to Birmingham to be president of Southeastern Bible College, I had a number of people tell me, you need to go see so-and-so a businessman whose name I will not call. He'll give you a million dollars. You could build a building on the campus and name it after him. And almost every other college in town has done the same thing. And he has numerous buildings named after him. I did not feel so led and I'm glad I didn't because in reality it was just a few years later that this man who was the uh, CEO and founder of a large health care company was caught up in a scandal and today he spends his days and his nights as a guest of the federal government if you know what I mean and uh, his uh, name is a disgrace and uh, I recall we were having a pastor's conference at uh, one of the large uh, civic uh, locations in Birmingham and you could actually see his name where they had ripped the letters down and were changing the name to something else. So that's not noble, but here, something that's worthy of respect, that's what we're to be thinking about. And then he goes on to say, whatever is right, that's the third thing that he mentions, things that are just, things that are righteous, things that conform to God's standards, in our day and time, there are many people who have a, a different view, for example, on marriage, on what uh, is right in terms of marriage. And uh, there are a lot of people who are politically correct in this area. But uh, many things that are not politically correct are righteous in the sight of God. And he wants us to be thinking about things that are right. And next he says, whatever things are pure. Uh, our day and time, there's an awful lot of moral impurity around many movies and books and, and other sources of amusement uh, have a lot of impurity. And the reality is he wants us to have thought lives that focus on that which is pure, that our focus be there. I give an example of why this is important. Uh, let's say that you're going to lunch today and you're going to eat cornbread. Anybody here like cornbread? I like cornbread. Well, let's suppose 
that the waiter comes out and says, I want you to know we only have 1% arsenic in this cornbread. Would you eat that cornbread? No. No, not a chance. Not a one of us, if we were told that cornbread contained even a gram of arsenic, would touch it. And that's the idea that Paul's after here. He wants our minds not to be focused on anything with the least bit of impurity, but to think about that which is pure. Whatever things are lovely, the word here is acceptable or pleasing. Uh, things that uh, their grace attracts you. It's the idea of something that has a, a pleasant or pleasing. Uh, you know, there's so many things that we can think about that are, that are not lovely. Things that uh, in our society today, uh, people like to focus on things that are negative. And here he's talking about positive and lovely things. And then he goes on, whatever things are of good report. And the word here is, uh, could be translated admirable or praiseworthy. Uh, for example, uh, about a week and a half or two weeks ago, one of the young ladies in our church had a musical performance in which she did an excellent job and received and deserved worthy praise. That's the kind of picture here he wants us thinking about that which is praiseworthy, not that which is not praiseworthy, but that which is of a, a good report. And then he adds two more things that changes the way he says it. If there be any virtue, and virtue is excellence. Here, looking at moral excellence, one of the key terms in the language of the New Testament. If there's anything we can think of with moral excellence, and if there's anything worthy of praise, Anything that's praiseworthy. Um, and some things are not praiseworthy. But he says, be thinking about, be focused on, be meditating on these things. Paying attention to these things. To give you an example of what this would be like. When I was uh, serving the college, there would be from time to time a young lady who would come in with a rather large looking uh, item on the third finger of her left hand would have a little stone on the end of it. And she would be focused on that. She'd be thinking about that. She'd be looking at that. She'd be showing that off because she'd gotten engaged to be married. And she was excited. She was thrilled. And that was the focus. And, and you know, she might have a class in biblical studies or she might have a class in English literature or she might have a class in geology. But she'd have a hard time focusing on those things because she'd be focused on that engagement ring. And guess what? The guy who'd given it to her would be focused on it as well. And that's what Paul's saying here. This list of things, this list of virtues, this right thinking, Paul says, I want you to keep your minds on these things. Don't let your mind slip off into the gutter. Don't let your mind slip off onto the ditch on the side of the road but he tells us to keep your mind focused on these things. And one of the reasons that he does so is that right thinking leads to right living. And that's where we get to verse uh, 9. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Thinking alone is not enough. But how our behavior needs to carry out the character of our thought life. And what Paul's been talking about in terms of thought life are things that demonstrate good and godly Christian character. And he talks about first the practice. We're to practice this. And follow my example is exactly what Paul says. And one of the questions that I have to ask myself and that you need to ask yourself is could I say to those around me, follow my example? Could I say to those in my community, those in my class, those that I'm surrounded with, those in my neighborhood, those that I work with, follow my example. Paul had taught them certain things. He said, first of all, you've learned these things from me. Paul had discipled them. He had instructed them. My definition in master discipleship of uh, the concept of discipling is life-changing learning in the context of relationship. And Paul had done that with his church in Philippi. He had built a relationship with them. 
He had taught them and that teaching had changed their lives. And so he says, those things that you've learned from me, those things that you've been taught, you've been instructed from the Word of God, he says, I want you to follow those. Many of them he's already mentioned in this book of Philippians. Things like, be anxious for nothing. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Be uh, like-minded, as he said back in Philippians chapter 2. All of these things, Paul says, I want you to follow these things. But he says it doesn't just come down to what I've said. It's also those things that you've heard and seen from me. In other words, Paul's life backed up his teaching. People could see in his lifestyle the things that he taught. And God wants us to be demonstrating to those around us that very same thing. That our lives are backing up what we're saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, Paul is in prison when he writes this. I mean, things are not going well for the apostle. He doesn't know if he's going to live or if he's going to be put to death. He doesn't know if he's going to get out and get to come see the Philippians again or carry on further missionary ministry, or whether he'll just die in prison or maybe even be put to death. But he's not anxious about the future, and he's not bitter about the past. Paul could have been bitter about the past, and sometimes we're tempted to be bitter about the past. But we can't think about and concentrate on and focus on those things that Paul mentioned back in verse 8 and be bitter about the past and be constantly bringing up what this person did to me or what that person said about me or something of that nature. We can't do that. It doesn't work. And he says we can't be anxious about the future. The future is in God's hands. He can see around the corner. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. You may say, well, I'm not sure about my finances. I'm not sure about my health. No, but you can be sure about the God who loves you and knows you and promises in verse 19 to supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now we won't get to that verse till next week, but what a joy it is to know that that's how our God is. He's a God who provides whatever our needs are. And Paul's going to talk about that because he's going to talk next about God's providential provision in verses 10 through 13. He's talked about right thinking leading to right living and that rests in God's providential provision. And here Paul expresses again his thanks for what these people have done. Notice how he begins verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. What did he tell them to do back in verse 4? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now Paul's in prison, and yet he says, I've rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Why? Because now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, even though you lacked opportunity. What he says here is that he received a gift from them, and he says, I rejoiced in the gift that I received. They had sent Epaphroditus who had been their pastor and with him apparently a financial gift to help support their ministry. They had not forgotten the Apostle Paul. And Paul is so grateful that they have not. And he said, you've given to me before, and apparently there's a period of time in which he hadn't heard from them. And he said, you lacked opportunity. You know, sometimes there are things that we would like to give to that we just don't have the opportunity to because of circumstances. Kathy and I were talking the other day about our friends who were gathered for a big conference this week and a commencement at the seminary in Nagpur, in uh, India. We've had the privilege of uh, being there on several occasions and being a part of that, and we would love to support that financially. Right now, we've not been in a position to do that. And the Philippians apparently were in a position where they weren't able. But God, in His grace, can make it possible that we will again be able to do that. And God can do the same thing for you as He did for the Philippians. Paul said, you continued to care, and now your care has flourished as you've sent this gift. But Paul not only wants us to talk about and learn about the gift he received, he wants us to understand the circumstances that he faced. And notice in verse 11, not that I'm speaking in regard to need, 
In other words, Paul says, I'm not trying to twist your arm to send me more gift. I'm not trying to ask for more support. Unlike some people that you hear on television and radio, he's not just every other word is send money, send money, send money. Kathy and I were listening for a short time this morning to one guy who was talking about all the money that you would receive and all of the things that would be yours if you'll just send X amount of dollars to me. I'm sorry folks, but that one doesn't pass the smell test and it doesn't pass the biblical test. It doesn't work. Paul says, I'm not asking you to send another gift. And notice what he says about his circumstances. There are three key words here. First of all, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And that word for learned is to be learned as a disciple. You see, Paul had discipled the Philippians. He had taught them. But God had discipled and taught Paul. And even Barnabas had worked with Paul and discipled Paul. Paul had learned as he had studied from God's Word and as God had taught him, he had learned to be content. This word content was a word that was used by the Stoics and it basically meant to be independent of circumstances. In other words, Paul says, as a student I've learned I don't have to let circumstances, good or bad, either lift me up or put me down. I don't have to think, boy, I'm so excited because I've won the lottery, or my, I'm destitute because I'm facing foreclosure. What Paul says is, whatever my circumstances are, God has given me that inner peace of mind that is content. I've learned that. That word is only used here in the New Testament. And I believe it is a vital concept for us to learn. God wants us to experience contentment. He goes on to say, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. And the word that he uses there is a word for intuitive knowledge. In other words, on the one hand, he had learned this as a disciple. He had been taught this. And then based on that, there are certain things that you intuitively know. Let me use an example. I never had the privilege, well I did have the privilege, come to think of it, I'd almost forgotten, of attending AAA driver's course. Any of you take driving lessons when you were younger? Several of you did. Some of you just learned the hard way, you know. But uh, I was taught that, and I actually had the privilege of teaching my mother how to drive. And I want to tell you, that was a nightmare. That took a lot of grace. But I learned a lot of things about driving going through that course. Now it's been a long time since I've had that course, but it has given me the basics so that I now intuitively know certain things about driving that you probably know as well. When the light turns yellow, it's a sign to do what? Speed up and run. No, no, no. That's the sign to slow down and be prepared for the light to turn red. When somebody blows their horn at you, that's not the sign to shake your fist at them. That's the sign to be careful and watch out and don't let them run into you. There are certain things that you do intuitively when you're driving. And Paul says, now I've intuitively learned to be abased. I know what it's like to not have enough. I know what it's like to be in difficult circumstances and he's in prison. And I know intuitively how to abound. Same word. Paul says, I've been there when things were abundant. And you know what? For most of us, life is that way. There are times when we are really in abundance, and there are times when things are just really rough and tight. And Paul says, in whatever situation I'm in, because of the things that I've been taught by God, I'm able to respond to those intuitively and to know exactly how. And then he goes on to say, to abound and to suffer need. I've learned to be full and to be hungry. I've learned to abound and to suffer need. And the word that he uses there, I have learned, the last part of the verse, was a very unusual word found only here in the New Testament. It's a word that means to be let in on a secret. In Paul's day and time, they had what they called the mystery religions. And there were people who would be initiated. And when they were initiated, they were let in on the secret, whether it was a secret handshake or a secret gesture or whatever it was. 
But Paul here is using it in the context of a secret that God has given me that I've learned from Him that will allow me to be full or to be hungry, to, know, to, to abound or to suffer need. I can deal with any of those kinds of things. Whatever the circumstances are, God has let me in on the secret. And the point is that God has let us, as well as Paul, in on the secret. And the secret is found in verse 13. Here's the secret Paul learned. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can handle any circumstance. I can face any trial. I can face any need. I can deal with abundance. I can deal with challenges. I can deal with rejection. I can deal with physical pain. I can deal with sorrow. I can deal with grief. I can deal with happiness. I can deal with ecstatic joy. I can do what things? All things. Everything. Through Christ who strengthens me. What a wonderful secret this is that Paul has learned. And that's the secret that leads us to contentment. That's the secret that allows us to think proper thoughts, to carry out proper actions, and in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, to have the strength and to be empowered for everything that life throws at us. And it's interesting, he actually uses two words for strength in verse 13. One of them is the idea of that strength that you have, the other one is an empowerment that's given to you. And he says, I have strength within me because Christ has empowered me. Whether it is singing in the choir, whether it is teaching a Sunday school class, whether it is serving on a church committee or board, whether it is being a good neighbor, whether it is visiting someone in the hospital or someone who is sick or shut in, whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's dealing with conflict in the family, whether it's dealing with a medical situation in my own life, whether it's dealing with a financial shortfall, Paul says, I can do what? All. All things through Christ who strengthens me. Now I want to make three or four applications to this as we close today. First of all, this is true for those who've trusted Christ. And if we haven't trusted Christ as Savior, we have to start there. The Bible says we're all sinners and because we're sinners, we're separated from God. And Jesus died on the cross to bring us back to God, to put us in fellowship with Him. And communion is the great picture of that. His shed blood, His broken body. And the beauty is He rose again from the dead as we celebrate every Sunday, whether the time changes or not. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't trusted Him, you need to do that today. Second thing I believe for those of us who are believers, we need to commit our thoughts and our actions to the Lord. We need to commit our thought lives to the Lord, whatever we're thinking, so that they'll correspond. And I would encourage you to spend some time meditating on this list this afternoon or today. I was really delighted when I went to visit uh, one of our people who is not able to attend church because he and his wife have a home where people are, uh, uh, they're taking care of people who have special needs. And I'd given him these verses to memorize a few weeks ago. And it was such a joy to hear Sean quote these verses and that he is hiding God's word in his heart. What a difference that makes. And I want to encourage each of you, memorize Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and then memorize 8 and 9. Sean told me, I haven't quite gotten nine yet, but I've gotten eight, and he quoted it perfectly. And I was so encouraged to see that happening. I believe God would have us to do that, to commit our thoughts and our actions to Him. Thirdly, we all have needs. They may be physical, they may be emotional, they may be spiritual, they may be financial, they may be medical. Whatever your needs are, commit those needs to the Lord in prayer. Trust Him for every single need. And I believe if we are carrying those things out, we will experience what Paul said when he said, I've learned, I've been let in on the secret. 
of how to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's bow together. Thank you, Lord, for this great passage of Scripture, for the significant lesson that it teaches us, for the fact that, Lord, in Christ, you can enable us to deal with any situation. And Lord, there may be those here today who are burdened down with situations, circumstances that uh, don't seem to have an answer. But thank you that you have an answer from our Savior.